Welcome to Taiwan Context. I'm Donovan Smith. All right, today we've got a great show for you. I'm really looking forward to this one. Uh, today with me is Michael Turton, and our topic is our wildly different introductions to Taiwan politics. <laughs> and I'm not kidding, they were wildly different. So why don't we jump right in. Mike, how did you first become aware of Taiwan? How did I first become aware of Taiwan? Let's see, I was traveling in India, actually, mm -hmm. and I was actually in front of the Taj Mahal, and I ran into some Canadian guys who were living here, and they said, oh, you got you to come here. They said it was great. Okay, Taiwan. This was right after Peace Corps, so this is like 1989. I just got a... Where were you in the Peace Corps? In Kenya. Right. So I left Kenya, and I went to India, first thing, and I traveled across India for a while, and then I was in Bombay Harbor, and we got on a boat to do the harbor tour and go out to the the Elephantic Cave Island, I think it's called inside that. I forgot, it's been years. And uh, there was a Taiwanese film crew there doing a TV show. And that was yet another introduction to Taiwan, right? And finally, when I got out of Peace Corps, I went back to the US and all my Peace Corps buddies, a lot of them were heading out to Japan because Japan was the big thing in the 1980s, right? Yeah. So I thought, I don't want to do that. Everyone else is doing it. <laughs> I want to be different. <laughs> so I came here and I was here for two years, but, but that was how I became aware of Taiwan. You know, that was really exciting time to be in Taiwan, but I was almost oblivious because my, because for my own life, that was just, you know, just like figuring out how to get food and where to find chocolate. Right. Because in those days, there's no chocolate, there's no wine, there's no coffee, there's no steak. Oh, come on. They had Shaoxing wine. <laughs> they had that uh, Taiwan Monopoly, Monopoly Bureau Rosé. <laughs> <laughs> and they so had the, arrived in 1989. 1989, yeah. Right. So... Yeah, I, 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 my first memories of Taiwan would have been when I was a kid. My parents, my father had a buddy who was Taiwanese, escaped the regime. And I remember when I was 11 or 12, bought a globe, and it was an antique globe, uh -huh. you know, as all the cool kids did. Right. And uh, did it have the nine dash line on it? Well, uh, uh, no. <laughs> because one of the one of the ways I, I dated the globe, I specifically looked for the status of Taiwan. Oh, wow. So I must have been fairly aware of Taiwan by this point. Right. And it was still part of the Japanese empire. On that globe. Right. Wow. So no 11 dashed line. And you knew that. Yes. So obviously I was fairly aware of Taiwan. By yeah, that is. Because I, I was like, I had no idea it had been a Japanese colony when I moved out here. Right. Right. I discovered all that later. I'm from Vancouver. I mean, a lot of Asian. Oh, know, right. Of course. So. So I got to, uh, so I'm 18, I'm living on my own uh, with some roommates, and we were partying like crazy. And I was 18, and this guy shows up, and he had been living in Taiwan. So he starts telling me about this. This would have been 87. I went off to college for my grand total of one year, <laughs> which I was switching to Asian studies. And then I came out here in 1988. One one year before you, and we stayed at the same hostel. Namaste you're the, hostel. And you're the only person I know <laughs> that I didn't know from that time that stayed at that same hostel. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> I stayed there. God, we it actually was in this building that doesn't no longer exist. It was torn down to build the metro. You know, you know where the it's right down from the Cosmos Hotel. It was at yeah. that time. Yeah, I had a buffet place on the first floor, so we used to go down there, and my cheap. Uh, Hostel mates would go down there and they would buy the soup. Then they would scoop up all the tofu in the soup and that would be lunch, right? Because right. the soup was only like five NT. Yeah. <laughs> it was so awful. <laughs> <laughs> and we moved from there, the Master Hostel, that building closed. We moved out and they moved the hostel to a building near the park. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and right above it was one of those illegal uh, stock market exchanges. Remember oh, those? bucket shops. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, bucket shops. Back in the day. So it was the building was constantly, you know, people constantly coming and going at all hours. Mm -hmm. And we, I left there. I came over with my friend Joe from high school, who who is a polyglot and a genius and good at everything. And and he had I, I came back from India and from traveling across Asia, which I'd wanted to do my whole life. When I was a little boy, I saw an illustration in a book. And it said it was of Sri Lanka, which it called Ceylon. So you know how old that book was. And it was this enormous bamboo plant and a woman was walking in front of the bamboo plant with a pot on her head, walking away from the observer. And it said something, 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 the world's tallest bamboo. And I said, I have to go there. Mm -hmm. 
And the whole of my life, you know, from that moment, I have wanted to come out here and live. So I'm actually living my dream. This is it. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I always wanted to come to Asia in high school, went to France on a trip. Uh -huh. And I just wasn't impressed with Europe. It, it, it didn't. It's nothing against it. It just wasn't vibrant. It always seemed to me like a big museum for exactly. white people. Exactly. That yeah. was exactly the way I felt about it in those words. Mm. And Asia was exciting. And yeah. Fresh and new. And it felt like the future. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially if you were raised like on Blade Runner, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. It was just like Blade Runner. It was yeah. so exciting. And so, yeah, I got out here and yeah, I was at Namaste. And uh, <laughs> I think I told you the story about the uh, there used to be military parades, which I think they actually had one the other year, but for, they stopped them for a long time. But they had these military parades for Double Ten Day. Uh -huh. And but they did a rehearsal down Zhengxiao West Road, <laughs> the, you know, just like before. And they did it at night. So, of course, we're a bunch of foreigners. We, you know, we had a bunch of dumplings and got a bunch of beer. And so we're sitting out there watching this parade, this, this, you know, rehearsal parade. So one drunk foreigner decides it would be cool to, to, to like, he finished his beer. So he threw it under a tank. Oh and no. The tank treads to see it crush. <laughs> and of course the guys in the tank freaked out <laughs> until they finally figured out that it was just foreigners goofing around. <laughs> yeah. Man. Things are so different then. I was I was living in the hostel and I lived with this girl. We we had the room and and I was living with this Japanese guy and every night he would just go out and play um you know the pinball ting 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 what is the pachinko? pachinko yeah. Yeah, he used to he played pachinko incessantly. He would play for hours. And so we always had the place to ourselves, even though she was living with another girl who would, that's a long story. But she and I used to go out to John Kaisek Memorial and stand and there would be no one there. The whole place would be empty. And this would be like early in the evening. Except the guards. Except the guards. And, and we would sit up there and neck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. My God. <laughs> so we were supposed to be asking each other about politics. Yes. How did you get into Taiwan politics? Well, okay. So I lived in Taipei for my first year mm -hmm. and I no politics, a lot of partying. Yeah. But you, you did learn stuff. I was, I was here during Tiananmen and then there were the, there was a, a big rallies here in, in Taiwan in support of the protesters right. in China. And there was at the time a much stronger sense of comradeship or kinship with the Chinese in China. Right. Back then. Yeah. So there were these huge protests at uh, Chiang Kai-shek Memorial. So I saw those. Of course, it was still a one-party state at the time. It was still a one-party dictatorship. Yep. People still didn't like to talk about their politics. They were still edgy and nervous and, you know, about talking about politics. Sure. And they, when they did, they'd talk to you in hushed tones and look around right. and all that. Except one guy, I was teaching a class, and this one guy just in sort of in the middle of class just kind of blurted out, I wish Taiwan was still part of Japan. <laughs> it was just, What an odd thing to say. Wow, okay. You know, and he, and he explained it. You know, Japan is free. It's a democratic country, which Taiwan wasn't. Right. It was booming economically at the time. Sure. So anyway, so the plan was to move to Taichung. But I got offered a job in Zhanghua County by a chain of Sesame Streets. Yeah, right. And I was working for them too at that time. Right. And I, I was the teacher. For, you know, I'd go, travel from one school to another. Yeah. Two of these bushy buns were owned by KMT Factional Pauls. Oh, nice. So, so you got the real introduction. I got the real <laughs> gritty <laughs> introduction. I mean, I remember in both of the both of those ones, I remember walking in and there was piles of 500 NT bills, like mountain of 500 NT bills. And of course, I joked, oh, is that for me? <laughs> of course. And they said, oh, no, no, no. This is for buying votes. <laughs> You know, they weren't, it, it, they didn't look like, it, 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 there was no embarrassment or anything. It was just a matter of fact, oh yeah, we're buying votes. Oh, right. That's how things are done, right? That's how things are done. Yeah. 
you know, there was no sense of shame or embarrassment. They weren't hiding it. And so the, these factional Pauls, one of them surprisingly didn't drink, but the other one. How is that possible? How can you be a politician in John Juan and not drink? Well, that one guy didn't. But the other one, who was the husband of the, the woman who ran the Bushy Bun, yeah. he basically got up in the morning, started drinking, drank until late at night, and would get up and then just repeat the process. So that's basically, he, he was drunk all the time. Right. And he loved to bring me out drinking. All right. So I got to see this sort of seedy underbelly <laughs> of Taiwan politics. And he would drink with everyone. It would be one guy would be an old, you know, an old guy with a little tiny shop. And we'd be drinking Zhen Liu Jiu, which is moonshine. Yeah. Or with farmers and drinking mead show. Right. And the next one, it's with factory owners or with fellow Pauls. And it would be XO. Sure. Hennessy XO. Yeah. He, he, he didn't mind. Yeah. You know, he would be it. And that's his job. <laughs> that was his job. Yeah. So, and I, I, I never was entirely sure why he liked to bring me along to these things, but uh, you know, it would be things like he would wake me up at 10, 11 in the morning to drag me out to go drinking. And eventually I convinced him to stop doing this because I had to teach later. Right. But I remember we'd go out and we'd go to a KTV with the girls there. In the side room, of course. Of course. And the people that we're drinking with are people like, at lunch, the head of Zhonghua County's police, <laughs> the head of the fire department, various other county counselors. And they're all getting totally drunk and screwing these women in, in the side room. Shh. <laughs> and, Reputations are at stake here. <laughs> so... <laughs> And now the, the story kind of has, you know, I've got a bunch of stories involving these guys, but I'll move it along. The story has a sad ending. Eventually, the wife, who really was basically my boss, she had a rule for her husband not to bring any of the mistresses home. Oh, no. How did he, how could you violate that rule? And he did. <sighs> So she demanded a divorce, which is definitely not the done thing back then. Right. Well, he freaked out because, of course, this is damaging for him politically. Right. So anyway, so the, the school was on lockdown. We had the big metal gate down because he was threatening violence. And my girlfriend at the time smoked, and at the time I didn't, but I was talking with her out back, and we heard this big crash. Somebody had apparently opened the metal gate and he'd thrown a brick through the plate gl glass windows. Because the bushy bomb was owned by his wife. Yeah. Yeah. So he comes in and his wife runs out the back and then I stand as a barrier to the back entrance. Wow. So I am a lot bigger than him. So he just starts smashing up the place. And as I didn't know technically if he owned it or the wife owned it, she ran it. Yeah. So I wasn't sure if it was his own stuff to smash or not, but I wasn't going to interfere because he, I knew because I knew the kind of power he had. He was able to get me a visa extension when the immigration guys had said, no way the cops had said, no. Wow. Um, you know, he'd pull strings and, do things like that. Wow. So I knew he was not someone to screw around with. Yeah. So eventually he comes over and confronts me. I was pretty sure that the wife is long gone. Anyway, he threatens me of and I course. knew he could easily get me kicked out of the country. Sure. I thought I was kind of doomed. Me and my girlfriend threw just a few, few things into a bag and we fled to a hotel in Lugang hiding out. Mm -hmm. Finally, this was worked out because I had a good reputation as a teacher and there was a kindergarten that wanted me. Oh. So a deal was brokered where basically I became their teacher and I got to stay. So oh, you lucked out. I did. Because uh, uh, otherwise I would have been kidding. You survived your introduction to Taiwan politics. <laughs> yes. Now the story <laughs> has sad endings, 
they eventually got the divorce. The guy died at age 47 of throat cancer. Oh, shit. That sucks. All the beetle nuts, cigarettes, and booze. Yeah, that'll do it to you. And then years later, the wife and her son, the one that I knew best because I taught him in class for years, did a double suicide. No way. Yeah. Wow, that's sad. Yeah. She was a really nice woman and her kid was, I liked him a lot. He was a fun guy. So. Yeah, I think you showed me a picture of him. I might have. So, anyway, so that's a, so that's the end of that sad story. <laughs> that's a really sad story. <laughs> so, what's your introduction? Well, everyone in my story is still alive. Mm. <laughs> so, I went back to the U.S. in 1991 with my ex-wife. We got married then in the U.S. I went to work for the Center for Taiwan International Relations, which is then right off Capitol Hill. It was in the building next door to FAPA. FAPA had an office there, and right. we had an office right next to them. So and, for listeners, explain FAPA. Oh, FAPA is the Formosan Association of Public Affairs. They were in charge of basically Taiwan stuff on the Hill, but we did that too. And nobody was doing lobbying, okay? We were not lobbying. We were providing information. Okay, <laughs> this is my, my boss drilled into me. We, we just provide information. So a lot of these people that uh, Kun Blau, and of course I met Garrett then, but Kun... Kun Blau, I hang out with him a lot. He's one of the funniest people that I've ever met. And he would like, and of course he knew that I knew nothing. I was a complete virgin. So he would just tell me the most amazing shit, pranking the shit out of me. I was working for Dr. David Tsai at that time. He was running it. And this was the WUFI office, World United for Moses for Independence, Mm -hmm. which is the quote, radical unquote, wing of the independence movement. If you ever want to know about the politics of the independence movement in the U.S., Linda Rigo is the one who really knows. Right. But they all they all took turns taking pot shots at each other, and one of them wiped out the others. I don't want to get into any of that. Mm-hmm. But people connected to Wufi had were involved in that assassination attempt in John Jingo at the nuclear power plant when he was visiting the U.S. in the early 70s. Mm-hmm. And I've actually seen the sniper scope that was made specifically oh, for that. Wow. Yeah. Someone in Taiwan has it. Let's see. And then when I was working there in 1989, they were working on the case of George Zhang who became Tainan mayor, I think. Zhang was in jail at that time because he was connected to the guy who bombed the provincial governor. I think that was in 1976. Remember, I think it blew off a couple of his fingers. Oh, yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah, so Zhang had a connection. He had, he, had, he had provided some of the materials or something. There was some, or overseen the incident or money or something. I can't remember what the connection was. But anyway, he was in jail. And they were having me write letters to Amnesty and of course, Amnesty was like, sorry, but this guy's a violent dude, so we can't get involved. Mm-hmm. I did this, I did some other stuff, and this went on for like a year. So finally, this is my introduction to Taiwan politics. I was working for the independence guys. Yeah, through the, the quote-unquote radical independence. <laughs> the quote-unquote yeah, yeah. radicals. And all these yeah. guys were like librarians and business owners, and you know, but they were radicals, quote-unquote. And uh, the really funny thing for me was watching how the, the infighting that went on between these people and the stinginess. Mm-hmm. You know, so like I asked uh, one of the bosses, look, you know, my wife's having a baby and I've been working here for a year and, you know, it's time for a race. And he looked at me and his brows furrowed and then he said, Michael, I'll give you a new title. <laughs> <laughs> that was my introduction to Taiwanese bosses. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good introduction in that I learned. I also had an office with another group that was new, next to another group that was working on Tibet. And so I got the full dose of Taiwan independence and Tibet independence. And both offices were full of books. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time, you know, reading and researching cases and whatnot. At that time, a lot of the people that you have seen in politics in the last 20 years, like Tunju, she was still in jail. I remember I, I must have written letters about her because she was one of the people in my case list. What's his name? Shiminda was still in jail. Mm-hmm. Shi Xinyang, I think, was still in jail as well. Right. And this was in 1991. Mm-hmm. And the national security law, which they passed after they got rid of martial law, which was martial law in all but name, yeah. that national security law, I think, extended until 1993. So that's when all those people finally got out. That was after I stopped working at this place. But it was a really good experience for that and also for seeing how the independence movement was dysfunctional. You know, the factions, the, mm-hmm. the jealousies, the inability of people to get along, even though they were working on a common and, and important cause. 
And I also had my first experience with the KMT spy organization, the student spies, oh, right? Yeah. I was at GW. I was doing a master's degree. And I took a class in the summer and I didn't know it, but that was the one that you had to take if you were Taiwanese because that professor was on their approved list. So everyone in the class was from Taiwan. And the professor would say something about Taiwan and there would be silence. And of course, I would raise my hand and I'd say <laughs> something, of course. And um, one time the, the head KMT student spy pulled me out of class. After class, he pulled me aside and wanted to know everything about me, who I hang out with, where I lived, you know, what was I doing? So, of course, I told him everything. Mm -hmm. And then years, years later, I was uh, taking classes at Changong. Mm -hmm. And the CCP students by there got interested in me. <laughs> so I'm proud to say that I have been the target of student spies from both sides. I'm pretty sure I have an FBI record. <laughs> um, I was with a radical Trotskyite group, even though I wasn't a Trotskyite. In the U.S.? In the U.S., yes. Uh, radical environmental group. And that was still during the Cold War. Oh, ah, okay. Before I came to Taiwan. Right. So I think the FBI has a file on me. <laughs> but I digress. That's not Taiwan politics. Yeah, the spies. Now, this is something interesting about the, those spies. Is by the mid-90s, it had become kind of a joke. Yeah. Because they had spies in like all the major companies and in college classrooms and all of this. Now, by the mid-90s, I was teaching at Thai Power in, in Zhanghua City. Right. And everyone joked. Everyone knew who the spy was. And it was a joke. Everyone joked about it. Oh, really? By that point. Yeah. yeah so he's like, was... yeah, I'm the spy. <laughs> <laughs> Just collects a little extra in the salary box there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, um, so by then it was kind of kind of funny, but it was a really serious thing. Oh, yeah. Tsai, Dr. Tsai, who was overseeing that, who was the head of the CTR when I was there, my direct boss, he was... His college roommate, this is why these guys hated the KMT so much. His college roommate had had some books on Taiwan history and they'd taken him away. They just, this was in 1962 or 63. He'd been disappeared. The stories I heard in the late 80s, people saying something to one other person behind closed doors and, and they threw him in a men, by, but this was by the 70s, yeah. early 80s. By that point, the KMT had gotten more subtle. They didn't take him out to a park and put a bullet in their head or you know, like in the 50s. Yeah. By this point, they took him and threw him in a mental institution. Damn. Ruined the guy's life. This was the woman I was dating her uncle. Wow. I remember one guy telling me about how he did his military service. He was a young guy and he'd just done it like a couple of years before. And he was stationed in Jimman. And when people tried to defect from China, they would shoot them on the beach. Why? Maybe they were spies. I, I don't know. Anyway, he was pretty freaked out about having shot someone. Yeah, I bet. Uh, you know, there was just a lot of this kind of thing. Yeah. And people just didn't talk openly. No, I didn't. It, it was one of the interesting things for me, like years later, watching the transition. When, you know, during the 90s, I would go out with people, right? Mm -hmm. And there was such a common dynamic. You'd have to be at a table with 15 people. 12 of them would be Taiwanese. And they would all be like pro independence, but they wouldn't talk. Mm -hmm. All of the talkers were KMT people. Yeah. And they would sit at the table and spout KMT nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. And then suddenly it changed. You know, after about 2012, 2013, yeah. suddenly the KMTers were a distinct and identifiable minority mm -hmm. and they had to become silent. People, I noticed that in the classroom, you know, people would spout pro KMT stuff in the in the 1990s and no one would say anything. And, the, and by 2012, 2015, they were being shut down. Other students would yell at them. And I think there's a, a cultural thing, too. Because remember when we arrived that you could really spot the difference between a mainlander and a Taiwanese? Yeah, yeah. There was a distinct cultural difference. Yes, yes. The mainlanders tended to be very confident, very self-assured. They were like American white men. Yeah, yeah. Like us. <laughs> but shh, right. maybe you. Okay. <laughs> but so they would express their opinions much more vocally. Whereas Taiwanese tended to keep their head down, would talk in circles, would avoid political subjects. Yeah, yeah. Whereas now you can't tell the difference among at least younger Taiwanese. No, the young the youngest, there's, there's no, no difference. difference no. 
Yeah. But this is the best generation of young people Taiwan has ever produced. Yeah. I the totally current generation. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's really an amazing, amazing, just amazing people. Now, when you were with Wolfie, you met a lot of people, didn't you? Yeah, I remember I met Richard Bush, who's a longtime Taiwan expert. And I had actually taken classes under Bob Sutter, who was the CIA desk officer, Taiwan desk officer, and the CRS, the Congressional Research Service Taiwan desk guy. And he was extremely knowledgeable and very measured. You absolutely, you never had any idea what his opinion was on any, anything. Hmm. He was very skilled. There's people like that. Who else did I meet at that time? A whole bunch of people. Do you remember when they negotiated the initial F-16 offer? A whole bunch of Lou Sholey and, and a bunch of other people came and came to our office. And I, no, I can't say that they would ever remember me, but I met them. Sure, know. yeah. Mark Chun, I think, who later became the defense minister defense of minister foreign minister. Minister. Yeah. And who else was there? What was he, foreign minister? I can't remember One what he two, became. Yeah. yeah. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. There was a bunch of famous people there at that time. I seem to remember meeting Pong Mingmin. Oh. But, uh, Very cool. yeah, except that. I accept that someone asked me, well, was his hand missing when you shook it? And I was like, <laughs> I actually couldn't remember that. So maybe I never <laughs> met him, right? <laughs> One of the interesting things to me that I saw at that time, which really brought home to me Lee Dung Hui's personal thing, is that I saw a photograph of him at Cornell mm -hmm. sitting at a picnic table with the guy who was meant to assassinate Chang Jingguo. Oh. So Lee was already in with a cabal of pro-independence people yeah. at that time. And then at this, while well, I was well, shortly after that, I had read his book, Intersectoral Capital Flows in the Economic Development of Taiwan, 1895 to 1960. And um, that is one of the most important books on Taiwan ever written. Hmm. And it talks about how the Japanese manipulated the exchange between industrial and agricultural goods to extract money from Taiwan, right? So they charged too high a price for fertilizer, which you absolutely had to have if you're going to grow Pong Lai rice. Sure. And that's how they, then you force everyone to grow rice and buy your fertilizer and then you set the rice price. They never quite succeeded at setting the rice price, but they did manage to do that with sugarcane because sugarcane was controlled by a small group of companies, yeah. whereas there were zillions of rice brokers. So they, the government never entirely got the rice price under control, but they still did make a ton of money. And then the KMG came in. Then the exchange rate under the Japanese between the industry and agriculture, that ratio was like 1.2, right? Under the KMT, it was like 1.5. <laughs> and Lee documents all this with numbers and statistics and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I noticed as I read the book that he almost never uses the term Republic of China. Oh, that's He used it once, I think, in the whole work. And I thought the person who wrote this, because it's one long condemnation of the KMT as an extractive colonial government. And it was the first one that I ever read. And it was all there in the numbers, right? I mean, it was undeniable. It was right there. And it was really fascinating to, to think what kind of mind wrote that. And I didn't really know who Li Denghui was, even though he was the president of Taiwan at the time. I didn't really know, you know, hmm. who he was. And this That's was... interesting. Yeah. Well, he was brought back, you know, because he's an agricultural econom yeah. economist and his PhD. That thesis won an award as the number one ag economics thesis in the United States that year. I think it was 1969. Huh. And so he was brought back shortly after that and he had to be vetted. And Zhang Jingguo personally intervened in the vetting and said, Li Denghui is okay. Let's just bring him in. Yeah. And, uh, and he was pretty quickly in the ranks. Yeah, he was there to fix agricultural issues, mm -hmm. which he never did. But he did. They made him mayor of Taipei. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. and he rose pretty fast. Hmm. And, so. so I keep trying to remember the name of the attempted assassin. Peter. Peter. I know it's Peter, Peter Leo or Peter Lee or Leo. Something. Yeah. It's, I know it's Peter. He was, didn't he run for office in Tainan a few years ago? Uh, he might. He have. was a legislator. He was, active, he was the head of Amnesty International that was before it. Freddie Lim. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I mean, he's free now and I gather he's still active. So yeah. Yeah. It's, it was a really interesting uh, introduction. And then when I got, when I got back here, I came back here to do research in 1993 for my master's. And then I came back here a couple years later and then stayed. But basically, we went back to the U.S. for one year to get some stuff done. But it was really the late 90s when you could see the enormous change that was happening in Taiwan society. People were talking openly. And then I worked at Fuin University, which is privately owned. Well, it was Technology University at that time. 
and it was pro Sung during the election oh, of 2000, right. right? So I got earfuls about how great Sung was, and I really didn't know anything about him. Right. So I had to do all the research and find out. I started getting more and more concerned about what was happening and hoping Chun Sui would win. And after he won, we went down to visit his house. Oh, right. To, you know, to meet his mother. But mm -hmm. at that point, she'd met so many million people. I mean, the woman was oh, like yeah. 80 or something. Yeah. She, she was completely worn out. But we walked around the village just like soaking up this atmosphere of, mm -hmm. of joy. Yeah. And that was probably my first experience of this politics as tribal, you know, identity mm -hmm. moment. You know, like it was like, for me, it was like going to a Browns game when I was a kid because right. we were all huge Cleveland Browns fans, right? You know, it's that same feeling of everyone having belonging to the same identity. And let's see. Then I opened the blog in 2005. Right. And I was just going to write about nothing. And then shortly after I opened it, my Joe did one of his crying things. <laughs> yeah, it's like, obviously, I can't say fake because this is a public thing. So I'll just say that I was skeptical of his sincerity. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote about it on the blog and I was like, wow, I could really write about this. Mm -hmm. And then it took off from there. Yeah. Yeah. So were you here for the 96 election? For the 96 election, I was not here. I don't think. I don't think I was here for the 96 election. I missed that. Yeah. I mean, because we had the missiles and all that. All that stuff. Yeah. 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 That was pretty intense. People stocking up on food, including me and water. And yeah, that was before people. <laughs> knew that the missiles weren't armed. <laughs> and, and China's going to do this stuff all the time anyway. Yeah. But it was it was a really, in, really interesting election to watch because it was Taiwan's first free presidential election. Right. Now, in the early 90s, I remember seeing uh, the largest political rally I ever saw, and I can't find any record of it anywhere. Yeah. I, I stumbled on it. It was in Kaohsiung. And it stretched on for, and this was 90, maybe 1990. So it was still authoritarian era. Yeah. And, but it was massive and it was a pro DPP rally. Wow. And it was just thousands and thousands of people chanting, Taiwan, Xi, Taiwan, Dong, Gok, Xi, Dong, Gok, Bo, Quan. <laughs> and, you know, there's all these trucks with all this artwork showing like KMT hand stabbing Taiwan and really violent imagery. Sure. And this rally stretched on and on and on and on and on. It was massive. And then it got to the stadium. And I wouldn't go in. People were like, come on in. And, and I was just like, uh, it's iffy politically being a foreigner right. on a tourist visa. <laughs> For sure. Who has to get it renewed every two months Yep, in the famous visa run. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I was paying attention to politics in the 90s. So I pretty early on, by the late 90s, I hated James Song. Yeah, <laughs> I had a pretty good impression of Maing Zhou from when he was justice minister because he right. actually did do some good stuff. And then they kind of like booted him out because <laughs> it was getting the KMT in trouble because <laughs> he was messing around with gangsters. Yeah, which yeah. tied, of course, to the factional Pauls, my friends and the police. And anyway, he's very corrupt back then. And of course, the reason I hated James Song so much is he was one of the few KMT politicians, him, Maing Joe, Jason Hu, who made the transition quite successfully from being a official, a KMT official in a one-party state dictatorship to actually fairly effective politicians. Yeah, Sung was a very effective politician in the day. Yes. Yeah. The reason I didn't like him specifically is because what he did is he would go and he was the governor of Taiwan province. Yeah, that still exists somewhere. It does, yeah, it yeah. does in Nanto. Um, it's downsized now, it doesn't do much. I think it's like five people, right? Yeah. There actually still is a provincial governor. Yeah. yeah. So James Sung would go, and still had some power then, and he would go to all these little tiny towns. Didn't he visit every township in Taiwan? Just about. I, I mean, think that was his, I think, I think he did that deliberately, thing, yeah. yeah. And he'd make promises at every single stop. Of course. 
And what ended up happening is it, his promises vastly exceeded his budget. <laughs> and so basically, he turned around to Lee Dung Wei, kind of shrugged his shoulders, and was like, what are you going to do? Yeah. So Lee and the national KMT and the government were basically either they shut him down and the KMT would look really bad because these promises were made. Right. Or they had to honor the promises. And I thought that was a really sleazy move on James Song's part. So there was that period there when he was really popular before the Ching, the Junching Bills case. Yeah. The where he it looked like he would win but i did not like him i thought he was a real sort of snake yeah well he'd been tutored by lee dung right this lee told him to learn some aboriginal and at least the greetings right and well song and, yeah song was one of those key people during that right after jing jingguo died that basically helped keep lee dung in, in power yeah, yeah. so yeah. yeah so they were close everyone expected him to be the KMT candidate and then Lee didn't back him <laughs> in 2000. And of course, the rest is history. Then they ran the and Jan. Yeah. And then Song Thank ran you, KMT. As an independent <laughs> and split the ticket. So they won 60% of the vote, but didn't win the office. Yeah. Chen Suibian squeaked through. Yeah. That was an amazing moment. Yeah. Amazing. 2004 was too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The assassination attempt. Oh, man, that was quite a year. Yeah. So I think we've talked about our introduction to Taiwan politics. Yeah, we need to talk about our introduction to Taiwan at some point. Yeah. Living in that, ninety, where was I? Number 98, Zhongshan North Road. <laughs> yeah. It was a tennis shop, and they had this, they had cut up this, <laughs> that was when there were still factories in Taipei in 1991, right? Yeah. 1990, 91. And so in the summer, you could feel the acid in the air, right? And it would, mm-hmm. it would burn in the back of your throat. And I lived right down there behind the train station at that time. And the top floor of this building where I was in, it was four or five floors. In those days, remember those phones that you had to Mm -hmm. put a penny in to operate? Yeah, the one NT coin phones. Yeah, the one NT coin phones, man. (laughs) So we had one of those. That was the only phone in the whole building. It's Mm -hmm. it's so weird to think back to that because I I bought a cheap typewriter. There's no internet. Yeah. There's none of the things that we take for granted today and never even think about. But in those days, that was the only phone for all of us on all five floors. Mm-hmm. And Taipei at that time, it's hard to remember. Right after the 1989 Plaza Accords, the NT floated up from 40 to 23. Eventually, it hit 23. So from 40 to the dollar, 23 to the dollar. So all these people, their wealth essentially doubled. So like people would just pay tons of money for you to teach them English. Jobs mm-hmm. would walk up to you on the street. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Ta- Taichung, too, is more like Taipei was 25 years ago. So I gave Not some, anymore. I gave some speeches to people in their early 20s uh-huh. about life in the 80s. Yeah. And their misconceptions are really quite interesting. And what they found interesting in the speech they, that really caught their attention. What caught their attention was, this was a real surprise to me, but the concept of post-restant. Oh, yeah. My God, I totally forgot about post-restant. I know. And I, it just popped into my head while I was giving the speech. I just mentioned it in passing. You had to walk down to the post office to make a long distance call to talk to your parents in the United States. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And you had to pay. Yeah. I went to the one by the train station. Yeah. So did I. Yeah. 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 And they put you in those cubicles. Yes. Those phone boxes. Yeah. You knew that you were being listened in. Oh, yeah. Of course. And yeah. <laughs> the other things that the, the other misconceptions that they had is that they thought the air was much dirtier now. No and way. Taiwan is more dangerous now. Then back then? I know. There were gangsters everywhere back then. The air was like China's now, but yeah. with soot. So you'd ride down the street, you'd be riding your scooter and for, you know, 10 minutes and you'd have to wash your face. Yes. Yes. I remember those days. You know, it, it was so dirty, so polluted. Remember when, was that 1997 or 98 when the, when gangsters came over from China and whacked the Taoyuan County chief? I thought and they never this, caught them. Well, they knew who they were, but they never yeah. caught him. There was that mass killing. Mm-hmm. There was the, there was a whole thing going on in the nineties. Yeah, the Chen Jingxing, the Chen uh, Jingxing case. thing, the Bai Bingbing, and uh, uh, yeah, he he and this, some some of his buddies, by the way, kidnapped Bai Bingbing, who was a pop star, his daughter. Because there was a lot of kidnapping going on in the nineties. Yeah, was, was a huge kidnapping amount of kidnapping, kidnapping for ransom. That was a big thing, and uh, they eventually killed the daughter. And they went on this sort of 
Bonnie and Clyde kind of chase all around Taiwan. Yeah. With all these shootouts and they kept getting away. Yeah. And so this guy was going around, but he turned into something of a folk hero to a lot of people. So this guy, Chen, Chen Jinxing, he ends up after, you know, his buddies all finally get caught or shot and it's down to him. So he decides to do something dramatic. And as he put it, he wanted to kidnap a hello to get more attention. Right. So he went to the, he was a member of the South African embassy. Oh, yeah. Forget his exact title. He wasn't the ambassador. He was, then he was one of the top guys at the South African embassy. Yeah. And South Africa had just cut diplomatic relations with Taiwan, so they were just about to all leave. So he basically breaks into their home and holds them all hostage. I remember that now, yeah. And because the press were constantly on the phone, the police couldn't get through. And so this dragged on for quite a while. There, you know, one of the members of the family got shot, and eventually the police. I think they talked him out, if memory serves. But you remember who was in charge of the police? Ho Yo E. That's right, New Taipei City, City Mayor. Mayor. Ho yeah. Yo yeah, yeah. That was a that was an anxious time for Taiwanese, right? Yeah, People were like, the social order is breaking down. Remember the DPP uh, Women's Affairs. She was raped and killed in a taxi. Yeah, in Kaohsiung. Yeah. In Kaohsiung, yeah. All kind of stuff. It's it's hard to go back and go back to the anxieties. The factories were leaving Taiwan, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you heard all these factory burnings because the owners would burn the factory, collect the insurance, and then use it as seed money to start a new factory in China. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the factories were leaving. They were leaving Taipei. The, it, people felt like everything was descending into chaos. The new democracy. People didn't know how to what it went, meant, what would happen. Mm -hmm. I think there was a lot of uncertainty there. A lot of political assassinations too. Uh, At the local level, factional polls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those uh, were that was that stuff doesn't happen much anymore. No, no, it's it's really rare now. All right, all right. So we need to come back with another conversation about life in the 1980s and 90s. All right, I look forward to it. Yeah, nice talking with you, man. All right. This has been brought to you by the Taiwan Report. For more content like this, become our patron at report.tw. Hey, I'm the Taiwan girl.